Detach yourself from the outcome. Stop trying to worry about making $100,000 or $10 million or whatever the number is. That is out of your control. You cannot force that to happen. You can only focus on the effort that you're putting in to the steps that you believe will lead to that outcome. We're market leader in Europe. And when it comes to focusing on something, I've always been focusing on the customers we had and make them as happy as possible. I learned more Chinese and improved my speaking, reading and writing ability in that eight week period than I did studying university Chinese for four years. Asking the right questions is very related to quizzes and you've been very successful with that. Can you describe like why you recommend these quiz funnels? Hey Ryan, thanks for being here. Sven, it's great to be here. I've been looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I find interesting about you is that you studied Chinese and uh, neuroscience. <laughs> How, um, why did you study Chinese and neuroscience? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. So um, when I was figuring out what I wanted to do in life, when I was a you know, teenager going to college, um, I was fascinated with the brain. And um, I was always fascinated with psychology and neuroscience. And so um, I decided to, to pursue a degree in neuroscience. And then along the way, um, I saw, sort of became really interested in uh, traditional Chinese medicine and the effect of traditional Chinese medicine specifically on the brain. And, and the thing that really spawned that interest was I saw a brain surgery performed with no anesthesia other than uh, acupuncture. Mm -hmm. And it completely blew my mind. And, and when I saw that, I said, I have to learn more. But in order to pursue traditional Chinese medicine, you need to learn Chinese. So I started studying the Chinese language sort of as, okay. as, a, as, a, as a conduit, as a way to do that. And then along the way, I really fell in love with the Chinese language and the Chinese culture and um, lived in China for almost five years and, and just really sort of fell in love with that, with that culture and, and the language and really the neuroscience of language acquisition and really learning to speak a new language. And, and for me, that's been a, it's had a big impact on my thinking as a business person, as a, as a mm -hmm. marketer, as a communicator, because whenever we look to serve an, a new audience, effectively, we're learning a new language. And mm -hmm. when you learn to speak like the natives, and, and if, if we were, you know, in person right now, I, I, I would tell the story of, of, um, of many stories that have happened to me as, as a white Caucasian guy mm -hmm. speaking Chinese over the phone to locals and then... <laughs> coming to meet them and then they you know meet in person they expect to see a a, a person with a you know a chinese face yeah. um i've had many of those experiences and i and i share those stories because it underscores the fact that when you when you can speak the language of your market not just the words they're saying but the way in which they're saying those words the accent the intonation the 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 every subtlety nuance it, it matters so much and so for me it was a very sort of influential experience uh, that's impacted and influenced my thinking as a as a business person as a CEO as a marketer. That's interesting. Um, so, the, so you you saw this open brain surgery. Um, is it like? Mm -hmm. Is 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 this is this like really real? I mean, wasn't the was the person person under any other influence? Like it was just these needles. Is that really? I am a bit. It was a. It, it was a. It was a. Yeah, I, I was fascinated as well. And you know, this is probably, gosh, over twenty years ago now that I that I that I that I saw this, and I had to under I had to understand it. And what I learned is that there there are ways to perform local anesthesia with with acupuncture in a very skilled way that I just I, I had to understand the mechanism behind it. And in mm -hmm. Western medicine, it's not something that is is I think really well understood, at least to the extent that you know it's there. Now in retrospect, right, with the wisdom that I have now, you know, 20 years later, I was a, an impressionable young man at this time. Um, you know, was is it possible that there was, you know, uh, uh, additional anesthesia above and beyond the acupuncture that was mm -hmm. administered to the patient? Is it possible? It's entirely possible. <laughs> but at that time, that's not how it was presented. It was presented as just purely um, local anesthesia okay. through um, uh, the acupuncture, which is what set off this interest. And it kind of led me to understanding, wanting to understand everything from the chi to, um, 
to traditional herbs and, um, and herbal medicines and massage therapy and reflexology and sort of all of these schools of, of traditional Asian medicine that I think we still in Western conventional medicine don't fully understand the mechanism behind it. Um, now, you know, you're asking me a question that is you're bringing back thoughts in my brain that I have not yeah. accessed in probably two decades now. It's been, it's, it feels like a <laughs> lifetime ago. Um, but, um, that, um, you know, really sort of spawned that, that interest. And, and I think we all have these times, like these experiences we have in our lives, right. Where it's like something happens yeah. and it's like, I, I've got to learn more about that. And that for me was one of those moments. Uh, yeah, for me, it's very interesting because I'm actually a dentist. So I'm also a medical mm. guy by training. Mm. Uh, mm. I have a Korean mother and she used to send me to the Chinese medicine people all the time. So um, I'm very familiar with it. And I, I've done a lot of acupuncture stuff like ha ha like on myself as, as the patient. So it's very, mm. it's very interesting. And did, did you extract any of that knowledge that you learned in this from the, from this field? into your business life? And if so, what are they? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think I, I spoke about one element, you know, for me, it was, you know, studying neuroscience led me to um, appreciate the value of, of good teaching, how to take an incredibly complex topic and break it down into a way that it can be understood. And so when I was in at university for two years, I taught a section of, of Neuro One, Neuroscience 101, so the mm -hmm. introduction to neuroscience. And, and, and I was challenged with this idea of taking these incredibly complex topics and subjects and, and distilling it down into a way that, you know, the, 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 the students who were just a few years younger than me could understand it. And, and what I learned in life is that it was a big lesson for me, is that you don't have to have PhD level expertise in order mm -hmm. to be a guide or mentor or teacher, mm -hmm. you only need to be one or two steps ahead of where your student is. And in some ways that can actually be an advantage because if you have that PhD level knowledge and you've had that knowledge for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you can forget what it's like mm -hmm. when you were a beginner in that field. And so for me, that's been a, a message and a, and, a, and a lesson that I've taken with me my entire career, especially because our business is one where we provide education, we provide training. Mm -hmm. And I think I see, I see a lot of entrepreneurs who are in that same place where they feel like they, they don't have, they haven't earned the right. They don't mm, have the yeah. PhD letters on the back of their name. They don't have all the credentials. So they don't feel like they are equipped. But at the end of the day, we're all just learners helping other learners. Like yeah. we're all on a learning journey, all of us, yeah. right? And, and, and I learned from one of my mentors that, um, and I've got kids so I can appreciate this, to, uh, to the fourth grader, the fifth grader is a genius. Okay. To the 10-year-old, the 11-year-old is a genius. And as adults, it's the same way. When we're just a few steps ahead of those that we're guiding, you have the benefit of, of wisdom and experience but you have the closeness of having just gone through that journey yourself. So that was a huge lesson that I took with me in the study of, of neuroscience, the study of Chinese that I've applied in our business in a, in a big way, not to mention all those language sort of observations um, that I mentioned a little bit earlier as well. I see. Yeah, I had that same feeling in boxing, like someone doing I'm doing sparring with and he's a little bit like, let's say ahead, but also not, not super skilled, but It, it seemed like right. a very giant leap between us. And it's like, yeah, it, the, other, the other guy looked like a genius to me, like uh, unbeatable, you know. It's, I, I had, and it's inspiring, I, right? Because if, if he's yeah. been training maybe just a year longer than you, you can see your future. You can see yeah. if I stay on this path a year from now, I'm going to be where he's at. And then there's going to be a new mini Sven that I'll be sparring with, who's going to yeah. look up to me and say, who is this guy? And, and that's just that, that journey. And I think it's just such a, um, it's, it's, it's one of the things that I just enjoy and love so much about life. I'm a lifelong learner. I think you are as well. I just yeah. love learning new topics and subjects and whatever the topic may be. And I think it's one of the pure joys of, of, of life and living. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how, How would you approach learning a new language? Like, 
from a neuroscience perspective, what's the most efficient way, in your opinion and experience? Because, I mean, Chinese is one of the most difficult languages there is. It's a difficult language for, um, for native English speakers, for sure. Um, and it's, it's definitely among the most difficult languages. And what I'll say is this, and this is from practical experience, it's just from my own experience and, and my own perspective. Um, to learn any language, the most effective way in my personal experience is complete immersion. And I'll, mm -hmm. and I'll explain what I mean by that. So I studied Chinese at the university level in a traditional classroom setting. And I studied for four years and I spent eight weeks in an intensive immersion program in China where mm -hmm. you are signing a contract at the beginning of the program where you're making a promise for those eight weeks, you are only going to speak Chinese, you're only going to read Chinese, and you're only going to write in Chinese. And if you are caught speaking your native language, you are kicked out of the program. Really? It's incredibly intense and it's for serious students. Now, um, here's the punchline. I learned more Chinese and improved my speaking, reading and writing ability in that eight week period, eight weeks yeah. than I did studying university Chinese for four years. So Whoa. for me, if I were learning any language, that's precisely what I would do. I would do an immersion program that forces you to not rely on your native language because when you do that, Sven, what, what I found, what happens is this. It becomes very boring to have a conversation that is, you eat food? Is it good? Is it good? Good. Bye. Did you eat? How was it? All right. Mm -hmm. See you later. That's a very boring conversation to have every day. So it when is. you're forced to like have a Chinese conversation, you got to learn new words. So you can say, "Ah, ni ti zu qiao ma." Do you play soccer or whatever? Have a conversation about something new. Otherwise. Uh -huh. It's the same monotonous conversation. Every day. Did you eat breakfast yet? Yes, yeah. I did. How was it? It was good. Okay, bye. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the full immersion thing. Would you, would you apply this to business as well? Let's say someone wants to learn marketing. Um, would you recommend and how would, how would you then apply it? Like, let's say someone is like a starting entrepreneur, wants to learn more about marketing. Should he or she watch YouTube videos all day long? Or what would you recommend in that case? Like uh, if trying to apply the full immersion thing. So the way that I've applied this to business, and, and, and I found this myself when I started my first company, when I started my first business, one of the things that I felt a lot of pressure around and anxiety around was it felt like I had to create the perfect business. Like it was mm -hmm. going to be the thing that I was married to for the rest of my life. So I spent far too much time obsessing over what type of business, what's the market going to be, what's the niche, what's it going to be, all of these questions that I think so many people go through and I didn't take action. And it wasn't until I made a shift in my mind and the shift, Sven, was as follows. I said, this first business, I'm just treating it like a practice business. Mm -hmm. It's just a practice business. And instead of, I didn't go to business school. I said, instead of going to business school, and at the time, business school probably would have cost about, I don't know, a quarter million dollars to attend business school, $250,000, give or take. So instead of spending a quarter million dollars on getting an advanced degree and going to business school, what if I take a fraction of that amount of money and I just pour it into this practice business and I treat it like tuition? Mm -hmm. And I invested in courses, I invested in paid advertising, I invested in basically all the things to learn how to build a digital business. And what was funny about this practice business that I wasn't, ex I wasn't expecting it to make money, I wasn't expecting it to be the thing that was going to, you know, create a fortune, mm -hmm. is that it became incredibly successful. And it's, it's what I learned from um, a famous uh, psychologist, psychiatrist, psychologist who just passed away not that long ago, um, Mahai Sixcent Mahai, who wrote the book Flow, mm -hmm. that the secret is to detach yourself from the outcome and focus entirely on the process. And that's mm. exactly what I did. It's exactly what I did when I was learning Chinese in Beijing. It's exactly what I did when I started the practice business. And it's the exact advice that I would give to anybody who's looking to learn a skill in business. Detach yourself from the outcome. Stop trying to worry about making $100,000 or $10 million or whatever the number is. Detach yourself from that. That is out of your control. You cannot force that to happen. You can only focus on the effort that you're putting in 
to the steps that you believe will lead to that outcome. Unless you're planning on going to your customer's house and, and, and taking their credit card out of their wallet and typing their credit card in on your website, you cannot force that to happen. You can influence it, but you can't force it. So that was the learning for me is detach yourself from the outcome, focus on the process, and the immersive experience is create a practice business. And that for me was the thing that kind of unlocked everything in business in my early days as an entrepreneur. Okay, I understand. Uh, the th like one of the most important things that are required to make a business successful is product market fit. So how did you approach that problem? Like, did you just choose a random business that a lot of people also do? Or did you choose any niche thing? Yeah, it's a great question. So product market fit in many ways is, is the heart of what has become a core tenant of, of our business, which is known as the ask method. And so the ask method, which is sort of something that we've codified into a framework, is really about asking the right questions to the right people in the right way to understand what people truly want to buy in any market. Not what they think they want, not even what they say they want, but what they mm -hmm. really want to buy. And in my first business, which was in a tiny, random, obscure niche market, my first business was in the Scrabble tile jewelry market, teaching people how to make jewelry with Scrabble tiles. My next uh -huh. business was in the orchid care market. My next business after that was in the memory improvement market because I, my, my parents were, were mad at me that I was uh, not using my neuroscience background in any way, shape or form in business. <laughs> They're like, what are you doing? You've got this expensive education and you're you know, teaching people how to make jewelry with scrabble tiles. Like, are you an idiot? What's wrong with you? So, um, but in every single one of those markets, the same thing was true. Um, it, I learned that um, people don't know what they want, but they do know what they don't want. Yeah. People are not good at telling you what they want because it forces you, this is bringing the neuroscience back in. It forces you to access a part of your brain where you're projecting into the future. And you are imagining a future possibility that you think is true. And we've all had these experiences in our lives. How many times have you you've wished for something? You've thought, this is what I want. I want to move to this city. I want to start this new job. I want to pursue this new career. And then you achieve it and you realize, oh, it's not exactly what I thought it was mm. going to be. It's not exactly what I want. And then we go on to that next dream, that next mission, that next big goal until we get to that point and we realize, oh, it's not quite what I, what I want. Maybe this is the thing. Like we, that's life, right? We pursue life like that. So we're not very good at projecting what it is that we want, but we are incredibly good at projecting and understanding what it is that we don't want. And the reason for that is because we're accessing a different part of our brain where we're going into our memory and we're looking in the past. And so, for example, you know, if I said to you, like, what's your dream car? Like, what, what, what would you, if you could wave your magic wand, you got everything in your dream car vehicle, what might that be? Well, you're going to start like just thinking of possibilities. Maybe it's a car that you have on your wish list. Maybe it's something that you've yeah. seen photos of or videos of. Like, you're just going to project that. But if I ask you a different question, I say, think about the, the vehicle you drive right now. If there's one thing about that vehicle that frustrates you, that annoys you, that you could change, what's that one thing? And most people are really good at being able to identify that. So, so for me to answer your question, you know, when we went into these markets, these were specifically markets that, that I or my wife or we and our family had some experience in, had experienced a frustration of our own and thought, gosh, if, if we've had this problem, other people must have this problem. So like the orchid care market, for example, the reason why we went into that market is because when we moved to China... We were living in Shanghai for a period of time. I, my wife was um, uh, pursuing a PhD in history. I was working in finance in, uh, in China before um, uh, starting my business. And um, when we moved to China, you know, my wife had never been. So sight unseen, had never been to China. And she said, all right, I'll move with you. Let's do this. And we get to Shanghai. And if you've ever been to Shanghai, it's a city of you know, 20, 25 million people. Um, and it is a urban landscape. There's no green. It is just buildings and smog. And so she said, if I'm going to live here, we need to like beautify our apartment. We need to have some plant life. So I said, okay, let's, I'll, you know, and she said, I always wanted to have some orchids and there's so many orchids in Asia. 
So we said, let's buy a bunch of orchids. We bought like, I don't know, a dozen different orchids. We put them all in the different places of the apartment. House was beautiful. And then literally like a week later, all the flowers fell off and they all started to die. So fast forward a few years later when we're going to start our business. And I'm thinking, what kind of business are we going to start? And I said, well, we can't be the only people who have struggled with orchids. Let's do a little bit of research online and come to find out there are a lot of other people who had a lot of the same challenges, and a lot of the same struggles. So when it came time to product to identify product market fit, we identified the biggest challenges that existed in the market by asking the right people the right questions, having conversations, using surveys, doing stealth market research to see what people are posting about in communities and forums. Facebook didn't really exist at that time in its current form, so there are no Facebook groups, but I would have looked at Facebook groups. And I came to find out that there was these same common set of problems that people struggled with all the time. And so we decided to create a business that helped people solve those problems, like how to get your orchid to rebloom after the flowers have fallen off, how to get how to repot your orchid when the orchid has outgrown its pot, which, which is a thing that causes a lot of people to kill their orchid. The flower dies after they do that. And then a whole host of things like this. And, um, and that business, you know, um, took off and in a matter of months, we're making tens of thousands of dollars a month and, um, grew that business to over, um, uh, uh, half million dollars a year, uh, a little over a year. Um, we've sold hundreds of thousands of copies of our, our book on orchids, uh, that we wrote and, uh, we're not PhD botanists. We're not experts in orchids, but I believe that. I am one of the number one experts in the world in orchid growers. And there's a big distinction. I don't know a lot about orchids. I know enough about orchids. I know the difference between pachyopetalums and cymbidiums and vandas and oncidiums and dendrobiums and, 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 and all the different varieties of orchids. I know enough, but I'm not an expert. But what I am an expert in is in people who are growing orchids. And that for me was a, a very key lesson that I learned that you don't have to be the number one expert in the world in the thing that you sell. You want to be the number one expert in the world in the people who buy that thing. Understand that market, understand those people better than any anyone else. I think that um, it's really important uh, to kind of know everything you can about that market. Um, but how, how can you find out what people really are about if they just kind of know what they don't want like right, how can you how right. can you find out what they do want from because there's a million things people don't want so so one of the things that you can do is you can start by asking a very specific set of questions and so for example one of the questions that um that you can ask is what we call in our business the single most important question is which is when it comes to blank blank being the thing that you help people with when mm -hmm. it comes to caring for your orchids What's the single biggest challenge or frustration that you're facing right now? So you're asking people what that challenge mm. is. And, and you can dimensionalize that further. You know, what's the thing that's keeping you up at night? What's the thing that when your head hits the pillow and when you go to bed, what's, what are you thinking about? What's that problem that you're trying to solve? And please be as detailed and specific as possible. So you ask that question and that can be in conversation. That can be in the form of a survey. It can be in the form of a, a text conversation back and forth on Messenger or WhatsApp or, you know, Telegram or anything like that. But you're really trying to get access to that. Then you're asking two additional questions, and this is really important. The next question is, how much time have you spent trying to solve that problem? And what you're looking for is a measurement of how intense that problem is. If someone mm -hmm. says, oh, I just ran into that problem yesterday and I probably spent a minute on it, it's probably not something that people are willing to spend money on because they just had the problem. They're, you know, it, it's, it hasn't set in. It's, there's not enough pain associated with it. And here's the magic question. How much money have you spent so far trying to solve that problem? Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is all things being equal. If someone is still facing a problem and they've spent a lot of time trying to solve it and they've spent money trying to solve that problem and they still have not yet solved it, they are much more likely to be a buyer for a solution to that problem than the person who says, I haven't spent any time and I haven't spent any money trying to solve that problem. So the secret is you listen to what everybody says and you ignore everybody except for what we call the hyper invested segment of the market. The people mm -hmm. who have an intense problem, who when you say, what's your biggest challenge? They give you a long, detailed, passionate, emotional answer who have said they've spent a lot of time trying to solve it and they've spent a lot of money trying to solve it. 
and you only focus on that tiny little segment of your market, that is how you achieve product market fit is by ignoring everybody else, the vast majority, and only focusing on that minority of people because they are the people who will spend money to solve Mm. the problem that they have right now. And so that's been a core tenet of, of every business that I've started, every business that we've built has been starting with that. Identify the hyper invested segment of the market and create a solution just for them. Oh, that's very good. Thank you. That that's awesome. I mean, yeah, it once be, because when people already have invested, then they cannot let go anymore really because they have invested. And it's a it's like exactly. You know, if you've invested in a bad relationship or if you're, if you, let's say you, you've invested in, I don't know, some, some, some crypto coin, cryptocurrency that, you know, goes down and then you're like, oh, I'm invested. So I'm, I'm going to invest more instead of like taking profits in between or something like that or, uh, going, getting out. Um, yeah, that's, that's very cool. Um, you, Do you think that um, companies in general or big successful companies are a good jo- are doing a good job asking their clients and customers about like um, what they want and not on, and don't want? Do do you feel like you know, it's, it's a, a it's thing? A, it's a big question. Yeah, it, it's it's a big question, and I think there's a huge range of how companies are uh, performing in this space. There's some companies that I think do a really good job and there are other companies that, that do a terrible job. The, the big cautionary tale that, that I always share is, is the company Lego, the toy company, mm-hmm. right? So we all know Lego, we all love Lego. And today Lego is uh, one of, if not the number one most valuable toy brand in the world. But in the early 2000s, at the turn of the century, at the early 2000s, Lego almost went out of business. They almost went bankrupt. And um, the reason for that is Lego, like most companies, reached out to their market and asked, say, what do you want to people who weren't buying Lego? And what they found was that people were saying that Lego is too hard. It takes too long to build. Mm -hmm. It's just too many pieces. So they said, okay, great. So let's make easier sets to build. Instead of having to construct all the pieces, we'll have fewer pieces. We'll make bigger pieces. You can build it faster. You can play with it sooner. They launched all these sets and then Lego almost went out of business. Mm -hmm. But in a last ditch effort, to try to save the company, they went back to their most passionate, most fervent fan fan base, what we just described as the hyper-invested segment of the market. Mm -hmm. And they came back and they said, Lego, we don't want easier sets. We want harder sets. We (laughs) want sets with more pieces, not less pieces. And so Lego responded in a last-ditch effort. They came out with a set that had more pieces than that they'd ever constructed before. And it, it sold out in minutes. And then they started creating sets with 2,000 pieces, 3,000. I'm a huge Lego fan. I'm an A-fan, yeah. adult fan of Lego. So uh, 5,000 pieces, 6,000 pieces, 7,000 pieces. And Lego today is the most successful toy company in the world. They have one product. They sell a plastic brick. Now, a lot of different plastic bricks, but they've got one product that they basically sell. So the lesson there is, I think a lot of businesses think the way to expand your market is let's listen to people who are not buying and let's serve that market. But you can't mm. do it at the expense of your core. And that's the lesson that Lego learned. When they started focusing and doubling down on their a foals and k foals, adult fans of Lego and kid fans of Lego, when they doubled down and said, let's build harder sets that are more complicated and more difficult to build, which is what people who don't buy Lego say they don't like about Lego, they ignored that segment of the market. That's when their business completely took off. So I think big brands like Lego, multi-billion dollar multinational companies, and tiny little businesses run by solopreneurs can all use this same strategy to achieve product market fit and to really understand your market at a deep emotional level. Thank you. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, We kind of did the same at Digistore24. So for example, mm. uh, really honestly, we're... So we're market leader in Europe, especially the German market. And... I never hired a sales team for Germany for some reason. We don't have a sales team. It's And we also almost did not do any marketing. But what we did was, because when it comes to focusing on something, I was always, I've always been focusing on 
the customers we had and make them as happy as possible. And it took so much effort, staff, energy, focus that I always forgot about, you know, new customers, new sales and stuff like that. But this is how we grew, actually, because word got around. And at, I mean, I don't know if it would work today, like when we have competition and when whatnot, but it was like our growth, growth strategy and it made us very, very dominant. And again, we're the market leader. And so we, we kind of did it just because, you know, like, but I'm also like business wise, I want people to be happy. And so I was like, okay, let's, let's take care of them first. So I would hire supporters and account managers instead of salespeople. And then, and I, I would keep pro procrastinating it. And I was like, okay, let's, let's just help them better first. And so it's, it's kind of like intuitive. Um, but if, if you just like almost only had successful, companies like they say success is a terrible teacher um how how could you learn and and like get to the next levels of business because you got an eight figure business as far as i know um how did you get like to the next steps in business just yeah. having success well there's a lot of there's a lot of failures along the way right and mm -hmm. uh, absolutely and uh, you know for me i'll, I'll share you know, a few of the lessons so uh, it's a lesson that that i've that i've shared before um that uh, ties in Lego again, you know, again, I'm a huge Lego fan. And, and what I learned along the way is that, um, you know, at some point, you know, if you think about it in your mind's eye, you imagine you're, you're building Lego um, on your table and you build one set and you build another set and another set. Well, at, at some point, like you're, the table is full. There's no more room. Like there's no more room. And, and what I learned, this is a hard lesson that I had to learn is that sometimes you have to break what you've built Mm -hmm. to build something better. Yeah. And I'll give you an example of this. We had a, 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 a program in our business. It was a mastermind. It was a high-level mastermind. And it was a $40,000 a year mastermind. And it was limited to 40 people. Like that was basically the, the maximum that we could, um, that we could you know, s support in this format, in this, in this model. And I thought, you know, in order to grow our business, in order to get to that next level, I don't see a path. Like the amount of time that this mastermind takes for me personally, the amount of uh, scale that we want to achieve in our business, I, I, I just don't see a way to grow our business. So it, 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 it reached a point where it was the biggest bottleneck in our company. And we made an incredibly scary decision at the time. You know, this was generating, you know, $1.5 million, incredibly profitable. Um, and we decided to close it. Literally at one of the meetings, I stood wow. in front of a room of 40 CEOs and I said, um, this is going to come as a shock to many of you, but this is our last meeting because I'm closing this group down. I mean, people's jaws hit the floor like this. We had a wait list of people wanting to get into this group. Now, it was scary at the time, but I, I saw that it was the only way to clear the table of all the Lego to build something better. Mm -hmm. And in its place, we built a coaching program. Now, the coaching program, unlike the mastermind, a mastermind is typically you know, oftentimes around a, a, an individual, there's oftentimes like a, you know, a, a person who's in the front of the room, who's leading the group with the coaching program, we built around a framework, around a structure, around a path. And that path is far beyond what we call our ask method success path, far beyond any one individual. And so the punchline is that what was once a 40 person mastermind, we've grown into a 500 person coaching program in mm -hmm. its wake. And there have been times along the way, that's one example, where I found that the only way to get to that next level is not to keep building on what you've built, but to actually take it apart, break what we've built in order to build something better. And so those are hard lessons to learn because, you know, especially when you've got something that you love, that you've, you know, you've put your heart and soul and passion into, uh, it can be scary to tear it down to build that next thing in its place. So for me, that's... Those are some of the um, lessons that I've learned. I'm sure there are smarter, wiser entrepreneurs who are listening to this right now saying, you're an idiot. You could have just continued growing it. But for me, those were the, the mistakes or failures that have been most instructive. Reaching a ceiling, not being able to get past that ceiling mm. and realizing that the best path for us was to start over and build something better. Okay, so but, but how could I, for example apply this if i wanted to let's say i hit a ceiling 
I, I, for example, I have a SaaS mm. company, as you know, Digital is a SaaS company. Mm. Um, probably I would not like just stop doing Digistore and how, how would you approach this? Like, um, because I mean, I mean, you, you, it's hard, it's hard for me to apply this principle. Like, I'm just curious. Mm. So, so what I would look at is this. So every business with that, that I've seen inside that I've been part of, if you look at the way in which the business generates income and revenue here today, you're going to find a concentration of revenue and profit in a disproportionate number of products and customers. Mm -hmm. So you will find that you have some customers that require more maintenance, higher cost, mm -hmm. that are not as productive. And this is true in any area of, of business or life. You have some employees who are not as productive as not as contributive. You've got some employees, team members on your team that probably do the work of 10 people. And then yeah. you have other people who maybe do the work of 0.75 people, right? Yeah. So what I found is that the secret is you, you have to constantly take a look at all of those metrics. So look at your customers. Who are the worst 10% of your customers? Mm -hmm. They're arguably, they're holding you back. If you use yeah. a garden analogy, what are the weeds that you need to trim back in order for the vegetables to thrive? Ah, you constantly need it. to trim that garden. Yeah. So look at your customer base. What segments of your market do you need to maybe stop selling to and actually remove from the platform mm. to free up your team and resources to go after more of the profitable customers mm. or maybe serve your most profitable customers in a deeper way so that way they can sell not a million dollars through the Digistore platform, but how do you help them sell $2 million? Mm. One client could probably offset... 2,000 of your clients that are incredibly high maintenance, that are generating you know, one sale a year on your platform, but have a million questions and are sucking mm. up your customer support. So how do you trim that back and double down? And that's what we're constantly trying to do in our business. Mm. What's the 80-20? What's the 95-5, right? What's the, 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 just the very few segments of our customer base, of our products that are producing a disproportionate amount of revenue and profit, and then how do we turn off all the rest? Yeah. Have, have, Free that, up space on that. that that's awesome. Thank you. Have you read The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss? I read The 4-Hour Workweek in 2000, 2007. I read The 4-Hour Workweek, and that was the book that inspired me to leave my corporate career. I was, had a career in finance at the time mm -hmm. and start my first business in 2008. Yeah, hugely impactful. That's so cool. Yeah, we, it, it, it's the Pareto principle. It's like you probably have like a, let's say, 5 to 20% uh, share of your customers that make 80% or even more of your revenue and that are really cool uh, and vice versa. Like like uh, 20, 5 to 10, 5 to 20% of your customers that are creating all the 80% of the trouble you have. It's, it's so cool. Exactly. And, and it's scary to let them go because you're saying, but wait, they're producing this revenue. We can't fire yeah. our customers. We can't shut them off. But what's amazing is when you trim the garden and you leave mm. more room, the, the garden will, thr will thrive. It will flourish. But it's scary to trim back because we think if we, if we kill it, what happens? What, can, we, can we not get it back? And, and it's still scary for me, even as I'm saying this right now, we have decisions in our business that we're constantly making. And it's scary to think like, oh, maybe we stop selling this thing, you know, mm. is it we're doing. In my experience, every time we've made those decisions, we have, it's been exponential growth. Mm -hmm. But how do you decide between like a project that is not successful yet and that you believe will be successful in the future, uh, even if it's not yet? Like, I'm, I, I've been in those situations. That is, so. that is the billion dollar question. How do you know, right? <laughs> it's like, when do you know? It's that, that picture that we've all seen before, right? Where it's the, the person mining yeah, underground. Yeah, exactly. And they stop two feet from gold. How do you know the gold exactly. isn't two feet away versus, you know, exactly. never going to get there? Gosh, you know, 
Sven, if if uh, if I knew the answer to that question, um, how, how would, you, you and I would not be having this interview right now. <laughs> yeah, we'd be probably sitting on our private island. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly we'd be sitting on our each of our own private islands and having this yeah. conversation um it would be a different conversation but um you know but i but i think that's where there as an entrepreneur we spend a lot of time having to make decisions there's so many decisions that we need to make yeah and i think that at some point there, there's and I and I see both sides to this. You can be a very analytical person. You want to look at the numbers, but in business, you are generally speaking going to have incomplete data. You're yes, never going to have complete course, data. You're exactly. always going to want more information. Like I need, I need this to make the inform- to make the decision. At some point, you need to, I think, rely on your um, intuition, yes. your subconscious mind, your unconscious yes. mind, because there is wisdom that you have that you you don't know where it comes from but that yes. that gut feel that intuition there is truth in that and yes. at some point when you've when you've read all the spreadsheets you've looked at all the data you've looked at all the analytics at the end of the day i've learned to trust that intuition and yes. it's never it's not perfect but generally speaking will lead you in the right direction oh yes yes um if you know Mind Valley, Mind Valley is a well-known company. Yeah. And uh, Vishen Lakhiani of Mind Valley, he's talking a lot about that intuition thing, and he he even does ads with like people who are incredibly lucky, evading like some catastrophe, versus people who are unlucky, like chronically unlucky. And he, and this is how he advertises the idea of intuition, and he says like okay there is like a a specific method to access intuition better um probably it has to do with neuroscience probably you can Mm. apply certain techniques to just become more in touch with your gut feeling um but yeah i totally agree ultimately it's the intuition that is like the last decider and it should be and uh, it's it's very important to develop that, yeah. Because, for example, a friend of mine who runs a um, an investment fund, and he he always asks me, he's like, okay, on the one hand, it's it's somehow terrible because there's so many investment funds and the regulations are so hard. Like he he's almost not allowed to sell it or to market it because of the regulations the SEC equivalent regulations in Germany. Uh, but on the other hand, if he makes it successful, then he's got, he'll, he'll do re- like, he'll make really big money, like really, really big, like billions. And so he's like torn apart between like the opportunity and, but, and the, the difficulty of the markets and the regulations and, and everything, especially around marketing. And I mean, he's a great marketer and a great salesperson. Um, but he cannot apply anything, <laughs> any of that. <laughs> right. Right. So yeah, it's it's really about the in- in- intuition. Um, was was there like an incident where you didn't listen to your intuition, to your gut feeling, and you kind of made the wrong decision, and you learned afterwards, like, okay, that was clearly a sign that my intuition. Yeah, that's a great was question. That's a really yeah, good question. Another way. Um, it's a really good question. And there's a, there's a time that comes to mind where I, about 10 years ago, I, um, had a, a serious, uh, health incident and, um, it put me into the emergency room and I spent 10 days in intensive care. And I emerged from that experience really, you know, feeling like, all right, if, if, you know, none of us are promised tomorrow, I had a young baby at home. My, my son was six months old at the time. And I just felt this need, this drive to, to do something now. Like I felt like, I, like I, I'm going to come out of the hospital and I, I have to do something now. And I, um, I, I made a rash decision to invest in a uh, very expensive um, uh, program, uh, really, that was uh, – around um, building a very specific type of business. 
And at the time, it was probably the most amount of money that I'd spent on anything. It was probably about $75,000 for this mm-hmm. program. For, for me at that time, it was when I was at that stage of my life financially, it was a, it was a big investment. Um, and uh, the person behind it turned out to be a crook, turned out to be a criminal, mm-hmm. um, and uh, turned out to just be a total fraud. And you know, in retrospect, I remember when I was making the decision to pull the trigger and make the investment. And I didn't have a whole lot of information about it. Like I, I knew a bit about it. It came upon a recommendation from somebody whom I respected. But I remember at the time, it didn't feel right, but I felt like I had to do something. Mm. Like it felt like it wasn't, you know, like I didn't feel like, oh, this is a good decision. It felt like I had to do something. And I think as business owners, we have these moments where we feel like that, where we say, I feel like I've got to do something, anything other than doing nothing. And, and for me, that was that thing. And I remind myself often whenever I'm faced with a big decision, um, am, I, am, I, am I going to make that mistake again? Am I going to go mm-hmm. back to that, that moment in time where I felt forced to do something, coming out of the hospital and having the sense of urgency and mm-hmm. just you know, needing to do something versus am I feeling it in my gut that this is, is in, in, intuitively, my intuition is telling me that this is the right thing to do. Um, so that was a very expensive mistake. Um, and uh, I spent $75,000 up front and then probably another $75,000 over the course of the next year pouring money into that project. So it was a $150,000 mistake for me, which at that time in my life and my career, that was a, I mean, that was a, that's a large amount of money for anybody. But at that time for me, it was, a, it was a very large amount of money and it was a very expensive lesson that I had to learn. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like so. It's it's interesting how your gut feeling kind of knows, and I, I believe everyone has that intuition. Basically, it's just like we have different different levels of being connected with it, and absolutely, and it requires like that you're not stressed. It requires that you sleep enough that you are also like sometimes meditate that you get some silence because your logical brain is like talking all the time like the monkey brain they call it in asia and uh yeah and yeah. so it, i think things like meditation are not a waste of time they're they're really good for you getting in touch with your intuition i think that's really yeah i can't remember yeah i don't remember where i first heard this but i think it was edison who was famous for it was either edison or einstein so someone will you know correct me from uh uh, in the uh, listener or watcher of this, um, that the secret to solving a problem, and I've adopted this mindset, is to think intensively about the problem for a period of time mm. and then forget about it. And, and, and the way, the visual that I have is, like if you think about, we have it in, in English, in America, we, we, we call them a crock pot. And a crock pot is like a slow cooker. So you put all the ingredients in the pot and then you just put the dial on and you just let it cook for like like six hours. And you don't have to do anything after that, right? You just put the, the onions and the vegetables and the meat and everything in the, in the slow cooker and it just cooks. And that's the, mm. the paradigm that I think about. So I think about, I'm just going to put these ingredients in my brain. I'm going to work really, really hard thinking about it. And then I'm going to go do something else. I'm not going to just forget about it. And then usually at some point later that day or later that week in the most unexpected time, I'll have the epiphany moment. And it's usually right after I wake up in the morning, when I'm in the shower, when I'm working out at the gym or when I'm on my bike exercising, when I'm walking in nature. And it's in those quiet times, as you just described, where it's like, I'm not, it's, it's, I haven't even thought about it. Like I haven't even been thinking about the problem Mm. sometimes for days. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, it just, it just comes. And, and that to me has never failed me in, uh, in my decision-making. So that is, uh, I think, a universal secret to success that anybody can apply, no matter what type of business or what type of um, industry you're in. Cool. Thank you. Um, what do you think of Web3, blockchain, NFTs, cryptocurrencies? What's your thoughts on that? Because I've seen a video oh, of gosh, you, man, you know, talking about this stuff. Yeah, you know, so, you know, I am by no means an expert in blockchain technology, NFTs, cryptocurrency, by any stretch. Um, but, but I do try to study human nature. And, and I've, I've been a student 
of, of cycles my entire life, market cycles, uh, seasonal cycles, uh, climate cycles, just cycles. And I think, you know, there's an underappreciation for the cyclical nature of life in general, that there are mm-hmm. cycles everywhere. When you yeah. look, you see cycles in every sort of monthly cycles, annual cycles, daily cycles. There's just cycles at a human level and at a, at a, at a civilization level as well. And so when I see Web 3.0, specifically in the context for the area that I specialize in, which is digital marketing, um, you know, I look at it and I see that we've, I believe we've entered into this third era of digital marketing online. So if Web 1.0 is like the first generation of the internet, that's when, you know, for the first time ever, you could create a website on anything. And we saw decentralization in a way that we'd never seen before. De-democratization of information. You no longer had to go to the library to look something up. All of a sudden now there are millions of websites on anything Mm -hmm. in the world. But then when people did that, they realized, okay, gosh, um, you know, creating a website's a lot of work, right? Like you got to maintain your own server. You've got to write your own code. You got to do your video hosting. And so kind of we saw these web 2.0 entities come together. We had, you know, the YouTubes and the Googles and the Facebooks and the Twitters of the world. And so, you know, instead of, um, you know, creating all these things yourself, you could rely on these third party centralized services to host your own video. And instead of creating your own website, you just create a Facebook page. Much easier, right? Than building your own website. And so we saw this massive consolidation and centralization. But now we've entered into, I believe, this new era where fueled by a lack of trust in centralized institutions at all levels. Now, it, it really first became mainstream after 2008, the world's financial crisis in the banking industry, mm-hmm. which emerged the you know uh, BTC and the whole cryptocurrency culture. That's the first mainstream form of institutions that we started feeling it. But ever since then, there is more distrust in the world across every institution that we rely on in society from the financial institutions, as I've mentioned, government distrust and now big tech so much distrust around all of the big tech data breaches that we've seen you know facebook how many times have we heard about a facebook incidents of oh yeah facebook using and stealing and misusing data in a way that we didn't appreciate so with this lack of trust this distrust and there's there are measurements of this there's something called the um, edelman trust barometer which is a measurement of trust in the world and they've been measuring it for like the last 10 years i believe and, and society is at a level of, of distrust. The default state of the world right now is distrust. Mm. So people are tired of trading their, their, their data and, and privacy in exchange for convenience. So people are taking back control. And of course, now we're seeing companies like Apple who are using it as a marketing angle, right? Apple's new angle, their USP is what? Privacy. Privacy, yeah. We're the privacy company. Now, they're not the white knight coming to save everybody. They're a capitalist company, corporation, that is realizing that what the consumer wants, there we go again, product market fit, what the consumer wants is is protection of privacy. Now, Apple has all this data on us. (laughs) It's not like Apple might not be sharing it with their competitors, with Facebook, with Google, but they have all this data on us. So, I believe we've officially entered into this new sort of third era of digital marketing. What I see as the web 3.0 of digital marketing and the seminal events Fen, that kicked it off was when Apple released the iOS 14.5 operating system in 2021, which put the choice in the hands of users. Users got to decide, am I going to allow my data to be shared? Yes or no? Mm-hmm. And when that happened, the, the, the pundits, the experts in the world estimated that between 10 and 15% would say, I don't want to share my data. Mm-hmm. Do you know what the, the actual number is? No, I don't know. By the measures that I've like seen? I would like to know. I would like to know. 88%. 88%. of people who have, have opted out to sharing their data. So the world has spoken. There is a shift, this movement away from Big Brother and AI super brains controlling everything to moving back to a world of personal choice, autonomy, personal mm-hmm. sovereignty. 
And I think all of these forces that are at play at a societal, at a global level, and this is not isolated to any one country, culture, mm-hmm. or language. This is happening in all pockets of the world right now. That I believe it's ushered a new era of digital advertising. And what it means is, just, just to bring it into practical terms here, is that every business online must have what we describe as a zero-party data strategy. Third-party data is a strategy where if you're a digital advertiser, you're relying on you know, the data for big tech. You're relying on mm-hmm. the data that Facebook is aggregating from all of these different places to create custom audiences and build interest and targeting lists. First-party data is data that you are gathering from people who visit your website, your business, in the background, in the form of you know, Google Analytics or other tracking tools, but you're still spying on people. Yeah. Zero-party data is going from spying to asking. It's that question again. Zero-party data is data that when someone lands on your website, they are explicitly volunteering to you, not being tracked in the background, but when you're selling backpacks on your website, instead of tracking the user's behavior and what other websites they're watching and the videos they're watching and their microphone is on and you're listening to the dinner conversations that they're having, that's all spying. People don't want that. They don't want algorithmic personalization. Mm -hmm. They want interactive personalization. When you have someone land on your website, the secret is to begin by asking a series of questions Mm -hmm. to understand that person so that you can better sell and better serve. If you're selling backpacks, it's, hey, if you tell me a little bit about you, your budget, Mm -hmm. what you're looking to use this backpack for, if it's for you or one of your kids, is it a travel backpack, a hiking backpack? If you tell me your favorite color, I'll be able to recommend the right backpack for you. That is zero party data that a person transparently is providing to you. Not being sneakily stolen in the background. It is a human to human conversational exchange. And I believe that businesses that adopt this transparent way of doing business are the businesses that are gonna succeed and thrive in an era where people have more distrust and are craving transparency and honesty more than any other time in history, mm-hmm. certainly as long as the internet has been around. So when you say Web 3.0, for me, yes, I know most people think NFTs, cryptocurrency, and blockchain technology, which I think is a, an offshoot of the distrust in the banking sector, but as a digital advertiser, I believe this is how it's manifesting itself. And these are the opportunities and solutions as we enter this new era. I see. Thank you. Yes, I. I agree. I, I'm very curious how that will look for the advertising world when you cannot, you know, do cookies anymore and maybe like imagine custom audiences or lookalike audiences would not be there anymore. I think, yeah, that might be a lot harder to uh, advertise. Um, and one of the, one of the things you mentioned is quiz funnels. Um, so asking the right questions is very related to quizzes and you've been very successful with that. So um, can, can you describe like why you recommend these quiz funnels? You know, all the reasons that we've been talking about, Sven. You know, quiz funnel. So a quiz funnel, just to describe what that is in action. Most people think, is it like one of those Harry Potter quizzes that you like take online? You know, what what Harry Potter character is your dog? Take the quiz. No, has nothing to mm. do with that, right? Those are entertaining quizzes. What we're talking about here is when someone lands on your website, instead of doing what most people do, which is you try to sell your offer or you try to get them to get your lead magnet, give me your email address and I'll give you my you know free report mm. or my free ebook or whatever. Instead of doing that, You begin in a very conversational way by asking a series of questions so you can better understand that person, what they want, what their challenges are, and then ultimately recommend the best next step for them. Now, quiz funnels, when we talk about neuroscience and psychology, are incredibly compelling because what you're doing is you're tapping into the power of Mm self-discovery. The thing that people care more about than anything else, it doesn't matter if you sell backpacks or Lego or anything in between, is themselves. Tell me more about me right? We are yeah. all our favorite subject. And when you think about the promise, the usual promise online is what? Click the link below to get my free ebook versus mm-hmm. click the link below to find out your unique results. It's mm-hmm. a much more compelling promise. 
Yeah. And we see across, you know, we have a software technology platform. We've had over 12,000 quiz funnels built on our platform. We have access to over 200 million data points. We've been, we've operated and, and helped clients build quiz funnels in 47 different languages around the world, 63 different countries. So this transcends culture, language, it's universal. And what we see time and time again is the following. Cheaper leads, mm -hmm. people are able to cut their cost per lead by anywhere from 30 to 90%. Higher conversion, mm -hmm. they're able to get two to three times the sales conversion on the back end of a quiz because instead of selling in a one size fits all way, what are you doing? You're customizing your sales message based on a person's responses. And number three, on top of all that, is you have higher satisfaction rates among your customers because you not only are better selling, but you're better serving as well. You're giving mm -hmm. the right piece of content or the right offer to the right people at the right time. So you have higher open rates on your emails, higher click-through rates on your emails, higher engagement on your stuff, lower refund rates. I mean, it's, it, the, the, the benefits are, are, are immeasurable. Now, people always want to know, well, what, what's the catch? Like, why, why don't more people do this? Well, number one, it, it, it takes some work, right? Sort mm -hmm. of like, you know, we all know the secret to getting healthy is what? You know, eat less and exercise more, right? <laughs> How hard could it be, right? Eat less, exercise more. But it's still yeah. not easy to do. Like we still, you know, get into lazy habits. So it is a little bit of work. Um, and the devil is in the details. It's not one of these things that you can just slap a, a fake quiz on your website and hope mm -hmm. for it to work. You truly do need, there's a lot of science and psychology in the questions that you're asking, the language that you're using, uh, best practices around things, number of questions, number of answers, um, how you frame them, images, no images, optimizing for mobile. So there are a lot of best practices that we've learned having done this now for the last almost 15 years in all of these different markets, but we found it to be more successful than anything else. Everything from businesses that, you know, literally start at ground zero, have no business, no list, no market, no nothing. They mm -hmm. launch a quiz and they're making $10,000, $20,000 a month in less than a month. To big wow. businesses, I literally just had a conversation with the CEO who uh, we worked with who built a company to over $100 million. He was selling $120,000 a day, generating 5,000 leads per day on the back of his quiz funnel in the golf market, so the game of golf, mm. and sold his company to uh, NBC, the, the TV studio, a uh, subsidiary of Comcast. So you know NBC, ABC, just mm -hmm. the big you know, TV studio here in the United States, um, sold his company to NBC uh, for a mm -hmm. life-changing amount of money um, on the back of his quiz funnel. So whether you are a solo operator, solo business owner, small business owner, literally just getting started, or you're looking to scale your company to nine figures or more, this is a strategy that you can use. And, and I'm biased because I've built all of my success, all of my wealth, personal wealth on the back of this strategy mm -hmm. in, in market after market after market. Um, and I've seen it time and time again with um, you know over 12,000 clients who have built quiz funnels on our platform and having success. So um, I'm passionate about it, Sven, because I've seen what it can do. Mm -hmm. And it really is the culmination of everything that we've talked about here today and certainly everything that I've, um, you know, uh, learned in, in my career as an entrepreneur up to this point. Thank you. That's amazing. So how, how do I approach the topic? Let's say I want to build Quiz Funnels 2. So what, what are my steps? Mm. Can you walk me through that? Yeah. So first thing that you got to get clear about is most people think, all right, so um, I'm going to design my quiz and I'm going to design it in the order that someone takes the quiz, right? Mm -hmm. So you start at the beginning. What are we going to call the quiz? What's the first question? What's the second question? The reality is you want to start in reverse. You want to uh -huh. start with the end in mind. You want to get really clear. What is the offer or the next step that you want someone to take after they go through your quiz? Is it to buy your products? Is it to sign up for a free trial? Is it to join your community? Is it to watch your webinar? Mm -hmm. What is the next step that you want someone to take? Get really clear on what that offer is. And I, I, like, I like to think about it like, have you ever seen, do you know the Indiana Jones movies? Are you familiar yeah. with those movies? Oh, yeah. Indiana Jones from the... Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so remember, I forget which one, maybe it's Temple of Doom, but Harrison Ford is on that rope bridge mm -hmm. and it's like connecting the two sides of the canyon, right? Mm -hmm. So I like to think your offer is on one side of the canyon, mm -hmm. right? The thing that you want to get people to, to, to buy. Yeah. Your market is on the other side of the canyon. Your mm -hmm. quiz is that bridge. Ah. We've got to get people from one side of the canyon to the other side. So let's mm -hmm. get first really clear on what are we selling? 
What do we want people to buy or what do we want mm-hmm. people to do? Then we want to design the right hook to attract those people to cross the bridge. And when it comes to a quiz, there are only three types of quizzes that we've seen. And this is a fun little exercise. You can do it right now in real time if, you, if, you, if you're curious. And anyone watching this or listening to this can do this as well. Three types of quizzes. We call them type, killer, score. So mm-hmm. the exercise is to think about your business, your offer, which of these three types of quizzes do you think is the best fit for you? So type quiz is where you're putting people into one of several types based on um, their circumstances, based on who they are. So an example of this is uh, we have a client who built a quiz in the weight loss space selling supplements. So this is very relevant to anyone who sells supplements on on Digistore Mm -hmm. called weight loss type. Mm -hmm. So this, this doctor came up with this concept that there are four different weight loss types, type A, type I, type G, and type C. And they all correspond with a hormone imbalance in your body, whichever hormone is most out of balance. If it's ghrelin, adiponectin, mm. insulin, or cortisol. And by asking a series of questions, he can help identify, of course, it's not a, a, a medical diagnosis, but he can help identify which hormone might most be out of balance. And based on that information, recommend the right uh, foods to eat, foods to stay away from, Mm -hmm. exercise to participate in, and the right dietary supplementation. And so he created this quiz and sells about seven or eight thousand dollars a day in weight loss supplements on the back of this weight loss type quiz. That's a type example. Mm -hmm. Now that's different from a killer example. Killer example is where you help people identify the biggest mistake they are making. We call it a killer Mm -hmm. or a mistake in their life. And so, for example, the example I just shared a moment ago, the golf one, um, that entrepreneur created a quiz. What's your number one swing killer? What's the biggest mistake you're making in your golf swing right now Mm -hmm. that's holding you back from hitting with consistency and accuracy and power? Take the quiz to find out now. So this quiz helps diagnose the biggest mistake you're making and prescribes the fix. So that's Mm -hmm. a killer quiz. Third one is what we call a score quiz. A score quiz is where you help people identify their score on a spectrum of success, right? So if you think about, you know, think back to school, right? If you got a A or a B or a C or a D, like what's your, you know, what's your level? What level are you at, right? Mm -hmm. You know, martial arts, are you uh, white level belts, yellow level belts, you know, black belt, brown belt? What's, what level are you at right now? Mm -hmm. So that works to help people identify A, where they are, relative to be where they want to be. And then the gap that they have based on where they are now, where they want to be, how do you close that gap? Of course, that's where your product comes in. Your product helps people close the gap, how to get from where you are now to where you want to be. So that's an example of a score. Um, And I think of, gosh, um, so many examples, but I think of Dr. Tanji Watkins, um, Mm -hmm. who was a total beginner. So she was a doctor, not not that dissimilar to, to yourself as a dentist. She was a doctor and she got tired of being in medicine. And so she decided that she wanted to um, become a coach, but she had no business, no website, no product, Mm -hmm. nothing. Um, But she was passionate about helping people find their career. So she created a quiz. What's your success alignment score? How aligned are you in your career? Take the quiz to find out now. She got about 5,000 people to take the quiz, created a pre-launch list, Mm -hmm. went to that pre-launch list and said, I'm open for business. Um, and in her first month as a coach, uh, made just under $21,000 in nice. income, literally starting from scratch. And now she's making twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven thousand dollars $27,000 a month in monthly recurring revenue mm-hmm. as a coach, all on the back of this quiz. So the exercise is type killer score, first decision, which one do you think makes the most sense for you and your business based on what you're selling? This is this is very interesting. Um, so you think it works for basically any niche? So any niche, any business. We any have e-commerce business. businesses, affiliate marketers. Who use this. Mm-hmm. A great great example for anyone who's on the Digistore platform, for example. If you are, I'll, I'll do for example. If you are a vendor, okay. If you're a vendor selling your own product, you can use a quiz to even if you only sell one product. You don't have to sell ten products to do this. If, if you sell one product. You can reframe, reposition that product based on a person's bucket. You can, for example, pick the right case study or testimonial or success story that lines up with that person as closely as possible in your marketing and tell that story 
to make it as relevant to the person taking the quiz as possible. Even if you're selling the same product to everyone, even if you're selling the same supplement to everyone, you can talk about a feature of that supplement Mm -hmm. based on that person's quiz answers. Now, if you're an affiliate, here's the slam dunk thing to do. Every Digistore affiliate in my mind should use a quiz funnel to recommend the right affiliate product based on Mm -hmm. a person's situation. So pick a topic, call it weight loss. Mm -hmm. Find the top five best-selling weight loss products in a category. Use a quiz to recommend the right one Mm -hmm. to a person based on their answers to the quiz. That's I mean, it's it's yeah, it's a, it's a slam dunk trick. We have students who do just that thing. Now, the beautiful thing is you might not be able to advertise as an affiliate on Facebook or Google directly to an affiliate offer, but you know what you can do? You can drive traffic to a quiz. Yeah. And your quiz can be that intermediate step because you're adding value. Yeah. You're not just saying, click here, buy. Yeah. You're, you're truly adding value. And that's the important thing. You can't do a fake quiz. It has to be a quiz where you are truly, the paradigm is attract, diagnose, and prescribe. Mm. And you have to add value. You are giving value for free after someone takes the quiz. You are are adding helpful information. You are teaching them something about themselves. Mm. And with that value, people are saying, ah, so what do I do about it? And that opens the door for you to say, well, here's what I would recommend. And your recommendation, of course, is that next step. Watching your webinar, signing up for your free trial, Mm. buying your product, or whatever that next thing. That's cool. Yeah, I've seen an offer built on quizzes, and it was pretty big. It was Medicore. Maybe you've heard of it. And it was like, you're you're like the promises you get, like your individual meal plan or supplement based on like what you gave as information for the quiz. Um, yeah, that that's very cool. What what other um, mistakes can people make, or are people making uh, when trying to use a quiz funnel? Yeah, you know, so uh, I mean, so many mistakes. One of the mistakes we talked about is the the you know the wrong offer, not getting clear on yeah. the, the process. Mistake number two, the wrong hook or the big idea, so the wrong type of quiz to get people in the first place. Um, you know, third mistake is asking the wrong questions. Um, like for example, what we found based on all the data that we have access to, again, 12,000 quiz funnels built on our platform. We have 30, 40 million people a year who take a quiz on our mm-hmm. platform around the world. Um, what we found is the sweet spot is between five and 12 questions, five and 12. Mm-hmm. So um, any less than that, any more than that, those tend to be poor performing quizzes. Now, mm-hmm. why is that? My hypo- I don't know for sure, but my hypothesis, my guess is that just like when you go to the doctor's you have to ask enough questions in a quiz for the diagnosis to be believable. Like you can't go to the doctors and say, you know, doctor, I hurt my hand. And the doctor says, I've got one question for you. (laughs) Is it your left hand or your right hand? And and you say, it's my left hand. And the doctor says, I know exactly what's wrong with you. It's like, you don't believe it. It's like they haven't asked for enough information. So you've got to ask for enough information for the diagnosis to be believable. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you can't ask for too much information because most people are taking one of these quizzes on this, yeah, on their phone. Exactly. So people's attention span is relatively short. So you can't ask for like 100 pieces of information. No one's going to sit through a quiz like that. Um, so what we found is 5 and 12 is the sweet spot. So wrong questions is another big mistake. Um, you know, wrong technology is, is a big mistake. And of course, I'm biased, you know, CEO of a software company. But the reason why we created this software is because we found time and time again, people are trying to use survey software, like, you know, survey monkey, survey gizmo, great pieces of software for market research, Mm -hmm. but not designed to convert clicks into customers. Or they'll use a one size fits all funnel tool that is great for, you know, building a funnel, like a lead page, lead magnet to a offer page to a checkout page. That's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't have the sophisticated technology to be able to put people into different buckets based on the combination of answers that they're giving. And, and when they have quiz functionality, it, it's like creating one of those fake quizzes. And we've all seen mm-hmm. those before, right? Where everyone yeah. gets the same answer or it just, yeah. you look at it and you're like, oh, this, this isn't real. And that is the worst thing that you can do. So, so the wrong technology is, is another big mistake. But Sven, I'll say the biggest mistake that people make is they overcomplicate it. 
Mm. They overcomplicate their quiz. They hear at this point in the conversation, people usually have one of two reactions. One reaction is either, um, oh my gosh, this sounds so complicated. How do I even do this? Or they say, how hard could it be? I'm just going to slap a few questions on my website and mm -hmm. call it a day. And, and both of those scenarios are recipes for failure. The mm -hmm. truth is somewhere in the middle. There, there is, um, as I mentioned before, the devil is in the details and the nuances matter. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of nuanced pieces to making this work and make it work well. And it's only come from, you know, 15 years of experience and doing this all day, every day that we've learned what those are. So those are some of the mistakes that we see people make who attempt this and struggle or fail putting it in place in their business. Yeah, I, I think people will feel if they like the questions or not. I think it's, it's it, the questions have to resonate. They kind of, yeah, they, they kind of hit that point that, that people yeah, are resonating with. I think this is like very important so that they take the quiz seriously and just don't see it as like a stupid, let's say, hoop marketing. Let me <laughs> jump through the hoop so that I'm invested right. somehow. And because I'm invested, I'll buy the product, right? Exactly. And it's much more than that. Of course, there's some commitment and consistency that's involved, but you have to add value. The promise needs to be something that yeah. is irresistible. It needs to be something that I want to find out my results. And if I've, been, if I've struggled to lose weight and, and my friends have lost weight and my, my you know, family has lost weight, but I'm not losing weight and I've tried the same things that they've mm -hmm. tried and I, I want to know what's wrong. What am I doing wrong? Well, have you ever taken the time to find, find out your weight loss type? Your, your sister might just have a different type mm -hmm. than you. Take this quiz to find out your type and we'll tell you what foods to not eat to stay mm -hmm. away from and what dietary supplementation you might want to consider adding. You are truly changing that person's life. You are going to help that person in a major, mm. major, major way. And that is the hallmark of a good successful quiz funnel because you're truly adding value. You're not, it's not just a marketing trick. It's yeah. truly something that adds value. Yeah, I can already feel it because those questions... Uh, they sound really like hitting the point. I like that. Very cool. Um, can you Absolutely. share an example of putting it all together? Do you have like a link? We could we could also show yeah. it in the video. Um, yeah, for sure. So we have so many. We we use quizzes all the time in our business. Um, you know, I'll give you one that we just um, you know launched. It's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it's the web 3 quizcom So if you go to the web 3 quizcom you can see it in action. And really, what we found is that just I bring that one up because it's relevant to our conversation earlier about Web 3.0 and kind of the changes. What we found is that many businesses are not ready for the changes happening. You know, they haven't installed conversion API. They're still using the old mm. Facebook pixel, for example. Um, they haven't uh, updated their, their cookie and privacy policy to be able to accept uh, data and have a zero-party data strategy. They're not using Google Performance Max right now to uh, have, you know, a better cost per acquisition on the Google platform. There's just so many things that people are not doing right now. They're just not prepared for Web 3.0. So we created this quiz. Um, are you re how ready are you for Web 3.0? And we help people identify which area of their business is the biggest gap right now and the thing that they should focus on first. Because like in business, what I find, I don't know about you, but it just feels like there's like a million things you always need to do. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I just need help prioritizing what is the most, what should I focus on first? And so this is a quiz that helps people identify what that is. And we, we just we literally just launched it like, like, you know, It's the thing that we just launched. So mm -hmm. I don't have, you know, amazing statistics to share. Oh, we've had a million people take this quiz, like some of our other quizzes that we've had hundreds of thousands of people take the quiz. But that's an example of one that kind of brings it all together where you can see a lot of these best practices in action. Um, mm -hmm. The web3quiz.com. Cool. Thank you so much for that. Um, if someone wants to um, learn more and learn more about quizzes and learn all your techniques or kind of get your wisdom, how, how can they mm. do that? How can they get in touch with you? And uh, what can you, uh, do you have any, uh, yeah, any course or anything that they can, that you can give to the audience? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm so glad we're having this conversation right now. And he, here's the reason why. So Sven, once a year, we do a, a week-long workshop 
on how to create, design, and build your very own high converting quiz funnel. And we go through everything from how to come up with your big idea behind your quiz, how mm -hmm. to come up with your questions, how to figure out what type of quiz is right for you. Should you use type, killer score? Uh, if you're the type of person that likes to see examples, we go through dozens of different examples and just in all sorts of different markets and languages and industries to really get inspiration and ideas for what your quiz uh, can be about the whole process from start to finish. Um, now, normally, we don't charge a lot for it. Normally, it's it's $100 mm -hmm. uh, for a ticket to attend. But we want to do something really special for all the Svencast listeners, which is if you go to the link quizfunnel.com slash Svencast and you type in the coupon code Svencast, mm -hmm. it will take that $100 ticket price down to zero. So it's totally free. The only catch is, again, it's it's a live teaching. It only happens once a year, and it's literally you know happening right around the corner here. So um, you'll go go to that page, and you'll need to, when you type in the coupon code, you'll have to click the link that says apply code, mm -hmm. and it won't even ask you if you use the code. You can pay $100. It's fine. But if you want to use the coupon code, it won't even ask you for your credit card. You'll just answer a couple questions, put the coupon code, and then you'll get instant access to, to the training and the resources and everything like that. So if you're interested or even curious about how to create a quiz funnel in your business, that would be the best next step. Um, and like I said, if you're watching this right now, your timing is, is perfect because um, it's uh, literally you know happening right now. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and can you give to, to the audience a last mindset tip? Like what's your number one mindset tip uh, that we uh, that that you would like to share? Yeah, I'll tell you my my number one secret in business and life um, is a secret that anybody can follow, and it's been this. And anytime I want to improve in an area of my life, whether it's fitness, marketing, business, health, being a better father, being a better husband, my secret is the same. I seek out a mentor in that area of my life, and I strive to become that mentor's number one student. Mm -hmm. Full stop. So seek out a mentor, become that mentor's number one student, and you can never go wrong in any area of your life that you want to improve upon. So that's always been my number one tip, what I consider to be my number one secret to success. Because look, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. We've all had amazing mm -hmm. coaches and mentors and teachers that have helped us get to where we are here today. And um, that for me has been um, you know, the most impactful thing that I'll leave uh, everyone with. Uh, across my entire career. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. It's been a pleasure and an honor to have this conversation. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the next one already. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the subscribe button and never miss an episode of Svencast again.